In this series, we will reveal some of the false identities we carry inside ourselves and discover the significance of embracing our true identity in Christ, the only identity that matters. And so we're beginning a new series today, a three-week series uh, called Identity. And um, uh, that's something that is, is a challenge for us to understand our identity in Christ. Imagine yourself walking into uh, some type of gathering, uh, maybe a, a party of some type, and there's these hello name stickers there, but they're not asking you to say, put your name on there. They're asking you to put what you do on there. You know, I, we, we identify ourselves, obviously, as our names, right? Um, and, and, and sometimes names aren't always so good, like Johnny Cash sang a song about a boy named Sue. You know, his parents must have really hated him. But uh, anyway, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times we identify ourselves by what we do. So I'm Bob the preacher, Bob the mechanic. Maybe you're uh, a cook or a caregiver or you're a busboy or a waiter or you're a lawyer or a business manager or uh, a farmer. You know, there's these different things that we often identify ourselves more so than just our name because oftentimes when we introduce ourselves or we're introduced to somebody for the first time, they exchange the name, right? And then the next question is, well, what do you do, right? And so uh, oftentimes uh, we're identified by what we do. Sometimes, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands from the guys on this, sometimes we're identified by what we don't do. What I mean by this is that sometimes we're identified uh, by what we have done in our wife's dreams, have you ever been accused of doing something that you shouldn't have done in your wife's dreams, right? A couple of you, all right, a couple of you, some of your wives don't dream apparently because I remember my wife getting up one day and saying, I can't believe you did this and I was like, I was asleep. I had nothing to do with that. That's your subconscious, right? Uh, and, and, but it bothered me for a while. It's like, man, I'm, I'm messing up in the dreams. How can I win? So I'm going to include that in my premarital counseling that you cannot be accused for what you do in the other person's dreams. Anyway, uh, sometimes we're accused uh, or, or we're known by what we don't do. Another way that we're recognized, uh, not so much about what we do, but where we're from, right? Where we're from. So... Uh, if you ask somebody where they're from and they're sort of embarrassed to uh, tell you where they're from, you need to press in on that because there's probably some unique thing about where they are from. Because we have some unique names in Virginia of where people are from. Uh, like there's Buzzard Roost, Virginia, right? So I was like, it must be hard to get down from there and go anywhere. But there's also Chill Howie, which sounds like some kind of place that was named in the 60s. Just chill, Howie. And uh, then there's Fries, Virginia. So some of you are thinking about lunch. There's Dumb Fries, Virginia. Uh, there's Bumpus, which you can pronounce another way, which sounds like a dance. Uh, there's Butts, Virginia. Croker, Virginia, right? Uh, I don't want to be from Croker. You know, you don't, the survival rate's terrible. Or this place, it sounds so sad, Dismal Town, Virginia. Yeah. I'm Eeyore, and I'm from Dismal Town, Virginia, right? Like, I don't want to be from there. Nobody's happy there. Uh, and uh, then there's one place that I think ranks at the very top of places in Virginia, and we all know it because we go there and drive by there all the time. Let's say it together. Tight Squeeze, Virginia, right? I mean, who's from Tight Squeeze? Where are you from? I, it's, not, it's irrelevant. Where are you from? No, really. No. Tight Squeeze. What? <laughs> can't believe you. So anyway, you know, there's these, we're sometimes identified from where we are from, and that's not always so cool. But uh, anyway, uh, what we're going to be doing in this series is finding our true identity in Christ, and it's so important that we do that because, see, everything flows from our core identity. And so this red circle represents our heart, our spirit, our, the deepest thoughts of our mind, right? And this might be a piece of relevant information for you guys. This Wednesday is what? What's this Wednesday? That's right. Some of you guys did not answer, so I'll, I, I'm sure on your way home, you're going to be at CVS getting that card that you so desperately need to get. But anyway, in, in this heart uh, represents uh, our values. And, and so Sometimes we don't know where we pick these things up, but we pick them up from parents, grandparents, friends, neighbors when we're younger, maybe. Uh, another thing that's in there is our expectations. 
our expectations for life, uh, expectations of others. Another thing that's in there are our attitudes, the, th- the ways we think about certain things, the way, way we process certain things that happen in our life, attitudes. And another thing are our life rules, like make your bed before you go out. You always cut out the lights before you leave the room, those types of things. And we pick these things up. We don't know always why or how we pick them up, but we pick them up and they're buried deep within uh, the very core of who we are. And so what flows from that is everything else that we do, that we think. Because what flows from that are our thoughts. From this center point flow our thoughts and also our emotions. And then that extends itself into our actions and our behaviors. So you see, it's so important that we understand who we are in the deepest levels of ourself. And getting that identity, if you're a Christ follower, getting that identity based on what God has said about us. And so some of you may be loving someone right now who's struggling with some type of destructive behavior or, or whatever. And, and oftentimes you're trying behavior modification. But what we really need to do is focus on their core identity if we want to see different behaviors, different actions, different thoughts, different emotions. And so our God, our creator, has said that he can transform anyone through his son, Jesus. Another way of talking about all this is identity determines behavior. The proverb writer says this, for as he thinks, he, for as she thinks in his heart, in her heart, so he is, so she is. See, the Bible's way ahead because God our creator wrote this book and he knows how we're made and he knows that we change from the inside out. He knows that we operate from the inside out. And so the church, sometimes you parents, sometimes you grandparents, we often make this mistake. We are focusing on behavior modification rather than a heart transformation. We're focusing on what people Uh, do rather than who they are. And it's easy to do that. I know as a parent, sometimes behavior modification is necessary in the restaurant but uh, or or someplace, public place like that, and you're like, "Mm, I need an attitude adjustment on top of the head. You know, like uh, sometimes you feel that way. Hopefully you don't do it that. But what I'm saying is that that we get kind of get caught up in, in even ourselves. We're trying to change our behavior when we're not focusing on what changes forever our behavior and that's how we think and how we process uh, life through the lens of who we are on the deepest levels and so uh, identity determines behavior we're going to be talking about this truth throughout this study now we're studying through a a part of Ephesians the book of Ephesians and Ephesians is a a letter that if you're just tuning into church just tuning into reading the Bible there was this very famous follower of Jesus, his name was Paul, and he wrote a number of letters, and one of the letters he wrote was to a group of people, Christians, that lived in the city of Ephesus. And he structures this reflecting what we have just talked about, that identity determines behavior, because you see what Paul does in the first three chapters of this book is he declares our identity in Christ. And so then he, in the last three chapters, he focuses on the behaviors that should follow when we understand what our identity is. Sometimes you hear a lot of sermons from Ephesians chapter 4, 5, or 6 that talk a lot about behaviors. And and, and so it's okay to, to preach and teach and read and study those things, but if we don't know our identity then we're approaching this backward. It's behavior modification. It's not heart transformation that leads to the desired different actions and behaviors. And so what Paul does here, he structures his letter helping these people understand who they are. Now, Paul establishes this church seven years prior to what we're about to read. So it's obvious that these people did not fully comprehend who they were. That's why he's writing either one to remind them or two to teach them for the first time as who they are in Christ. So a little background on this city of Ephesus. It was the crossroads of Asia. It was the latest, greatest technology 
uh, fashion wear, food, because it's, it, there's these trade routes that crisscross. This, it was known as, as the city of Asia. It, it was a beautiful city. It's what we call the modern-day Turkey on the West Coast. Uh, the population during the writing of this letter was 250,000 people, so it's a big populated city. It's, 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 a, it's a very, uh, like I said, it's a trading center. It's, it's the co-ho city of the Olympics. So there are three primary cities the, the Roman games took place in. This was one of them. And some of you may have watched uh, the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics in Korea. And uh, uh, it was an amazing display. And it gives that city great pride to be the host place, right? So they were very prideful about th their grand gymnasium, which uh, so much uh, took place uh, during certain times of the year. And, and they were very uh, proud of that. Uh, in this uh, picture, you see that building in the, in the far back background. That was one of the seven wonders of the world during that period of time. It was the temple of Artemis, or that's her Greek name. Her Roman name is Diana. And so uh, th this temple uh, governed uh, every, or it, it invaded every facet of anyone who lived in this city, because that's where the city bank was, one of the biggest banks in the Roman Empire. And, and there were all these rituals that were connected to that. And people served as priests, and they brought gifts. And so uh, it was a, a major influence of not only Ephesus, but we also learn by reading Acts 17, verse 26, there was a silversmith there who was in opposition of Paul's work, and he was making idols of Diana, and he said that this goddess was known throughout the whole world, that she had an influence throughout the whole world, one of the major gods of uh, that time. And so it was also a place, a center of education, a center of toga parties, a center of drinking parties and food parties. Yep, they had parties of food, right? And I won't go into the details about that because it's not very pleasant. But uh, what I'm saying is these people had a lot of identity found in where they were from and what they could do. And so Paul is writing a letter to them to correct their misunderstanding of who they are in Christ. So let's begin reading then in verse 1 of, of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, just let me interject here, that he does not call them the church, uh, the, the church of Ephesians, right? He, uh, we call them the Ephesians, right? But he called them God's holy people. Holy, the word hagios in Greek. And so it means that they are set apart for service. They are, they are saints. In the moment that they come to an obedient faith in Christ, they are saints. They are made clean. And so he does not talk about their national identity as Roman citizens or their city uh, identification, but he talks about their eternal, most important identification, and that is that they are in Christ God's holy people. Now, we sometimes refer to ourselves, well, I'm American. I'm American, right? I'm American. And, and I love America. I love the United States of America. I think it's a great country. I think, you know, I'm not putting that down at, at all, at all. But what I'm saying is that is a temporal identification of anyone in this room. It's temporary. It's brief. Nations come and go. But our identity in Christ is not based on something that's temporal, but something that's eternal. And that eternal person is Jesus Christ. And so, we see this sometimes in like sporting events when we see football players from two different teams after the game. They go and they meet on one corner of the field. They take a knee and they pray together. What are they doing? They are setting aside their identification as a team member and going to what is most important to them, their identification as a saint of God. And so, so we should get this too. Our true identification is not where we're from or what we do or what team we belong to but we belong to the holy God in heaven through Jesus Christ. And so he goes on to say, Praise be to God and Father our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with 
every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Now, some of you got up this morning and said, I'm lacking plans for lunch today or dinner today, or I'm lacking the funds to fix my car, or I'm lacking uh, the energy to get out of bed, right? Uh, you know, whatever. Um, uh, but in Christ, we lack nothing. We're not at, there's nothing that we don't have that we need to follow Jesus. And, and so it's so important that we understand that in this Grand, long sentence, and I didn't read all of it. That It's one sentence beginning in verse 3 and ends in verse 14. We call it a doxology, and so it's where Paul is giving praise to God. In this one grand sentence, Paul is saying, we have all these spiritual blessings, and this word in Christ appears 11 times in this first chapter. The word in Christ is the biggest descriptor of any follower of Jesus in the entire New Testament. It appears in one form or another at least 140 times. That is the best description of any follower of Christ is that they are first in Christ. Not in themselves, not in this world, but they are in Christ. And so uh, you feel like you might be lacking something, you're not lacking anything. Nothing, no mental ability, no physical, none of that is, all that is irrelevant in Christ. Now, that is good news. And anytime you want to say, that's good news, is fine with me. Because uh, then I know you're paying attention, we're getting plugged in, and it's so important. You know, some of you are, you know, like, I, well, I don't say amen, you know. Okay, okay, say, that's good news. Good news, you know. Okay, there you go. Anyway, he goes on to say, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of, of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one, meaning Jesus, he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mystery the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times reach their fulfillment which is taking place right now to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ this is God's Word. This is his revelation for us today, and we need to just sit back and ponder this grand doxology, this grand praise that Paul gives God about Jesus Christ. Because you see, Jesus is the cosmic uh, center, he's the cosmic redeemer, he's redeemed everything. And so, we look at history starting, you know, in Genesis or starting way back when and ending who knows when, and, and but God looks at history differently because. In Hebrews, we learn that Jesus is the consummation of the ages. And so everybody is looking for the Messiah before Jesus comes. And everybody's looking back towards the Messiah because he's come. And he is the cosmic center. He's the consummation of the ages. And, God, and Paul says, this is so grand. This is what you need to know about yourselves. That God has called us out of the world into his son Jesus and we have all that we need and this is what he had set in motion from the very beginning of time that he would have a people that he would have a family that he would have the ability to have a personal relationship with every individual that he created because of what his son would do for them Woo! I'm almost tired, <laughs> but I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited in the Lord, right? And so uh, uh, this good father, this good, good father, right? We sang it, has made us sons and daughters in Jesus. You might have had a crappy dad. You might have had an absentee mom. You might have grew up, but here's what we have in Jesus. We have a good father, and we have a friend named Jesus, and you are not alone and all this is made possible through the cosmic saving work of Jesus Christ. Now, God has called you and me out of a former identity. 
Out of a form, so you were something before you came to know Christ. Now that you know Christ, you're becoming something new. The old identity must be put aside. And that's sometimes very hard to do. Because our identities in Christ, they develop through the Holy Spirit, but our identities outside of Christ come through a number of different influences, right? Because we're told something about ourselves or given a name something, a long way back when that, that is given early enough and it comes often enough that we begin to believe it, even if it's not true, Right? So these names are given early and often, and we begin to accept them. Even though they're not true, early and often, we begin to adapt to them, you know? And so it's, it, it, it's, it's like um, uh, when I was growing up, <laughs> when I was growing up, there was this two friends of mine. We were best friends. And uh, they were given names. We were all given names early and often. And so uh, Steve, one of my best friends, uh, he was the first guy in our, in our posse to grow facial hair, right? So he had, nub, he had these little black nubs. So guess what his name was? Nubs, right. Nubsy. Hey, there's Nubsy. And he carried that name even to this day. I, sometimes I keep up with him on Facebook. And, uh, and, and people still refer to him as Nubsy because that name was given early and often, and he adapted it into his own, his own identity. And then my other best friend was Bose. And his older brother called him Bozo the Clown because he would, you know, at uh, different times make mistakes and it was a derogatory term and his brother was kind of picking on him, really picking on him. And he got the name Bose, so it was Nubs and Bose, right? And you're wanting to know, now you're wanting to know, what was my name, right? Well, well I'm going to show you a picture, right? So here I come, I look like an Irish hobbit, and there I am in fourth grade, I think, and if you wear a red a shirt with strawberries on it, you are a manly guy. I'm just telling you, I had to fight a lot to get that, you know. Remember that day when you took pictures at school and your mom would put you in a shirt you never wore any other time? You're like, what is up with that, you know? And so, yeah, let's get rid of that. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I know, somebody like, you're too transparent, Bob. I mean, really, you know, you, you can leave some things to the imagination. But, but anyway, they called me Reb because when I showed up in Pennsylvania from East Tennessee, I talked like this, and this is, you know, y'all, y'all, you and's coming over, you know, and they're like, where are you from? You know, I, you know I'm from Bug Tussle, Tennessee, you know. <laughs> no, it was really Maryville. But, but who was from Bug Tussle? Who was from Bug Tussle? Come on, come on. The Clampets, come on, you people. Oh, man, where, what in the world? I'm telling you, you guys need to get more coffee. But anyway, uh, so they called me Reb, and so there we were, Nubs, Bows, and Red. And that's, who, that, you know, that's, that's our identity. And so these labels, they come from our friends, they come from coaches, they come from parents or teachers or grandparents. And if they're said early enough and often enough, we believe them, even if they're not true. And that's important. And so it's like, for example, the man who is called stupid, but he has three PhDs and he still sees himself as stupid. It's a fitness instructor that's got a great physique, but, they, but she thinks that she's still fat because she was told that early and often. Uh, it, it, it's, it's the innocent teenager. It's the teenager who was uh, called ugly and, and they still think they're ugly. And so, you know, it leads to bulimia and anorexia and those type of things. And so they're told early and often enough, they begin to believe it. It's the child who's blamed for the divorce, the child who's blamed for the sexual abuse that came against them, and they think they're guilty, and they're always thinking they are guilty, even though it's not true. If, you, if it comes early enough and often enough, we begin to adopt it as our identity, and that's a false identity. That's, that's a corrupted identity. That's an identity that will lead to destruction. So if we're going to see real change in who we are and who we want to be, or we're going to see real change in who we love and the children we're raising and the people that we're leading and guiding, we have to focus on the core identity. We have to look at that to see change in behaviors, thoughts, and actions. Now, our identity is the truest thing about us. As I said, there are some things that we believe, even though they're not true, but our identity is really the truest thing about us. And so I've read to you already, and we'll talk about this again in a minute, but I've read to you already the truest thing about you is that you're in Christ, because that's not based on temporal, that's based on eternal, right? And so I want you to listen. I want you to plug back in. 
Listen, the truest thing about you is not that you were divorced, diagnosed with an illness, or disabled. The truest thing about you is not that you were cheated or feel defeated, or as a child you were sexually mistreated. The truest thing about you is not that you got a DUI, stayed high, dropped out, got locked up, or got knocked up. The truest thing about you is not that you uh, slept around or always feel down. The truest thing about you is not that you were convicted, evicted, or addicted. The truest thing about you is not what they said about you in junior high, or what they said about you on Facebook, or what picture they posted about you on Snapchat. The truest thing about you is that you are in Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so we must decide. you got to decide this almost every day. Everyone. Who you are. Because you'll go on autopilot. I go on autopilot and I think about what people have said about me. Or what I have done. Or where I have failed. That's not the truest thing about me. The truest thing about me is about Jesus Christ. Look, in Christ we receive a new identity. Aren't you glad you came today? You've received a true new identity in Jesus. And so here is the truest thing about every follower in Christ. It's an identity that we have not achieved, but we have received. He has given it to us by faith in Him. And so it's so important. In Christ, your identity is not earned. It's given. It's an identity not about how many points that you scored or how great a car or house you have or how many trophies you have on the wall. It's an identity not earned. It's an identity not wrapped up in how well your children socialize or how educated they are or where they've graduated from. It's an identity not based on how good a business person you are or how uh, excellent you are in some, uh, some kind of art form. It's an identity found in Christ and Christ alone because it's an identity. You hear me on this. It's an identity that is received, not achieved. Because here's the thing. When we begin to base our identity on what we have achieved, guess what's going to happen? The achievement gets harder and harder to reach because it's a performance-based attitude about life. So if I do well, I am well. If I do bad, I am bad. Who wants to live like that? And so... I'm so glad that you've come here today because it's so important for us. Look what Paul has said. Let me remind you again. I want you to look at these words, listen to these words because there's a test at the end. (laughs) Not really. We're saints. We're blessed by our Father. We are chosen and blameless and adopted and given grace, an abundant grace, redeemed, We're told the mystery of his will. We have the secret sauce. We have the cure for for all of mankind's ills, which rest in sin. We have obtained an inheritance. It doesn't matter what you have here, because that's all going to go, right? And and sometimes you're working on something, you're trying to keep something working, you're like, oh man, I can't wait till this burns, right? But sometimes we have really nice things. Well, they're going, and we're going to get something way better, because God's making it, right? Right? We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is our identification mark. That is your Holy Spirit tattoo on your soul. And when you stand before the Lord, He does not see you as you are. He sees Christ wrapped in, uh, you wrapped in Jesus Christ, His Son. And so, uh, our, what, what is our role in achieving, uh, I mean, in receiving this new identity? What, how does that happen? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, just like a wind blows over us. We have a participant, a participa- yeah, that word. We participate in this, right? And that's why I'm about to share with you that here's what you do. Submit. Now, guys, it means you got to get on your knees and you got to ask for forgiveness and you got to humble yourself before the king of kings. Women, you got to do the same. All of us submit to the work of the Holy Spirit. And here's what's so good and important. God does the heavy lifting and giving us this new identity. Did he not die for us? Walk out of a tomb. And so we've received this new identity. And so God's greatest work is 
is, is working inside of us. Now, the Holy Spirit is working on all of creation, all right? The Holy Spirit is working on the entire world. We know this from what Jesus taught us, that, he, that the Holy Spirit is trying to draw all men, all peoples, all mankind, all people kind, I think it's a new PC word, all people kind to himself, right? And so, uh, so, so this new identity is, 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 is from the Holy Spirit, but, but he does our, his greatest work in us, not on us. And let me explain. There's a couple real important words in the New Testament that oftentimes we just don't catch them, but we read, and this is the letter that comes before the letter we just read, Galatians 3. We read, for as many of you were baptized into Christ Jesus, have put on Christ, and listen again, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So that word, that prepositional word, in, is ice in the Greek. We would spell it E-I-S, right? And so, uh, the Holy Spirit is doing His greatest work inside of us. But we also know that the Holy Spirit is doing His work upon everyone. And so you're saying, well, I'm just checking in, or I've just come to church a couple times, or, and I don't know if the Holy Spirit... Well, the Holy Spirit's working on you, but He's working upon you. And it's real important that we understand how, this, how the Holy Spirit works, because here's a little sword. This is smaller than the one I previously had, you know. This comes from Madrid, Spain. It's very precious to me. You cannot touch it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this sword is upon... I couldn't do this with the other one yet, but I will. This sword is upon me, right? And that Greek word is epe. The Greek for upon or on is epe. But Paul says the Holy Spirit, when we're baptized into Jesus, the Holy Spirit is working ice into us. It's a completely different scenario if I put this inside of me right now, right? There's a few EMT walking up to me going, that was a great sermon illustration, but it's the last one I'll ever do, right? You know, So the Holy Spirit on, the Holy Spirit in. He's working on everyone, but he's working in those who are followers of Jesus. And so that looks like for us in the day-to-day, -day, you get up and you pray, even if it's a brief prayer. If you have YouVersion Bible app, it gives you a scripture every night before you go to bed. In other words, every day you're allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you through prayer, through reading the Bible. Then once a week we come together and we gather and we celebrate what God has done or what He's doing or we encourage one another. We participate in the Lord's Supper where Jesus is sitting right beside you with His arm around you saying, You are my child. And I love you. And so it, it, we're beginning to take the very shape of Christ. And here's something important. You older people know this, because I can say this now. I'm 55. You older people, right? I, I think I can get a discount at Bojangles. Someone told me that. But I'm too embarrassed to ask for it. But anyway, <laughs> we have not arrived. That means no matter how old you are, how long you've gone to church, you still have something to learn and something to allow the Holy Spirit to change inside of you. Because this work finishes when Christ returns. And we shall be like Him. And that's going to be awesome. I can't wait for that. I'm like, woo! I'm not that little Irish guy anymore. All right. Paul says in another letter, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're a doulos of God. You're a slave of God if you're a follower of Christ. That means you're not in charge. God's in charge. That means he's Lord of our life. He's curios. May not be very well received in some parts of the world, but this is really the truth. And he's bought us out of slavery to death and brought us into a servanthood of light and life and hope for the rest of the world. Now, this is another sticker that you see there. This belongs to, right? Who gets to put this sticker on things? The person who bought it. Some of you moms go really nuts on this, right? When your kid, kid first goes to school, like you got it on their pencils or lunchbox or underwear. I don't know why you put that on their underwear, but my mom used to write my name in my underwear. I don't know why, but, uh, and I'm still doing it. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> Marie does it for me. So, uh, <laughs> Who gets to put this belongs to? The one who owns it. Christ owns me. He owns you if you follow him. He owns us. And that's a good thing. 
because he's bought us out of slavery. In 2011, there was this awesome story printed by the AP about this renaming ceremony that took place uh, in a small uh, town, well, Mumbai, India. And there were 285 girls that uh, were called Nokosa. Now, that's a common name in India, you see, because the most unwanted child in India is a female child. And so oftentimes, they're discarded at train stations. Uh, This happened in the Roman Empire. In the city of Ephesus, it was very famous for this to happen. This is why the early church was made up of so many women. It's because uh, often these female babies were thrown in the trash heap, and the Christians in Ephesus would come and raise them as their own children. So these girls had experienced the same thing in India. Because, you see, any nation that's not submitting to the lordship of God can do things like this. And our nation is struggling with similar things. But anyway, these girls were called Nakosa, which means unwanted. That was her name. So they, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, adoption agency, they, they're, they're going to go through this renaming ceremony as they transition from one life to the next. And the AP says that, Uh, The 285 girls lined up with bows in their hair and their best outfits lined up to receive a certificate with their new names along with a bouquet of flowers. The girls got to choose the names. None of them chose Nakosa. All of them chose names like beautiful, prosperous, lovely, All of them chose names that reflected what they wanted to be known as. Now you and I, in Christ, have been given a new name because we belong not to ourselves or to the world or to any past identity. We belong to Jesus Christ. And our new names are written in heaven. Now, I'm going to pray. Our worship team is going to come up and lead us And then I have a few more words to say. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is just pray with me as the worship team comes and plays. Father God, thank you for purchasing each one of us out of death. And Father, thank you for giving us a new name, a new identity, not grounded in what people have said, but what you have done. And so Father, would we come to fully embrace an identity that is not achieved but received and help us to live in such a way it's in Jesus Christ's name that I pray amen Amen. so there's a pen in the chair before you take it pull it out and if you don't have a piece of paper write it on your hand but I want you to write the name of who you are in Christ So, you might write down blessed, adopted, full of grace, redeemed, forgiven, not guilty. I don't know what word that in in this moment that we have right now with you and I and God and the Holy Spirit's, you know, working within us and around us. What is it? that you find your identity in Christ best expressed as right now. We're going to be doing this and something like this throughout these next couple of weeks. Because I, I really hope that all of us could find our truest thing about ourselves in Jesus. That's not fleeting. That's not disappearing. That's not based or rest upon our performance or what someone else has said about us. That we could truly grasp our identity in Christ. And so some of you, the first thing that you want to write down is like failure, divorced, addicted, stayed up to 2 a.m. watching porn. I don't know. Here's what I know. That in Christ, we are redeemed bought with a price and his name is on us 
During these next few moments, our worship team is going to play a hymn, and, and you'll have an opportunity to go back to the next step room and talk with one of our pastors, Dennis Tucker. And if you'd like to have a conversation about anything that I've talked about, you can begin it with him right now. Or you can reach out to any one of us throughout this week. But we want us to get this thing that we are transforming into the very image of Jesus. Not by what we do, but what by the Holy Spirit is doing in us. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at cornerstonechatham.org.